last night. Who's ready for a fantastic day today? Round, uh, not round of applause, but show of hands, who was not here yesterday? Awesome. Well, welcome. You missed the first day, but this day is packed with so much information. You're going to love it. Okay. Most of you know who I am. My name is Jimmy. For those of you who do not know me or forgot who I was, I started here as a student. Got my first house under contract after six months of being with the school. I am a senior student liaison here at Investor School and a real estate investor and stock options trader. I'm also a new coach here as well. I'm passionate about helping all of you reach your goals, and I'm also a new mother to a beautiful baby girl sitting right here. <laughs> At this time, please silence your cell phones. If you need to take any calls, please just step out to the lobby and take the calls and just come right back in when you're finished. Use a microphone when asking your questions. Our microphones are not the best, honestly. <laughs> so you literally have to hold the mic up like this for people to hear you. We are streaming on Facebook, so if there's someone, a spouse or someone you know that would like to watch, you can share that information with them as well. They can find it on Investor Schooling or Larry Steinhouse's page. But most importantly with the mics, your questions are important. So just hold the mic up to your mouth very closely so that we also hear you. There's bathrooms right here to the left and there's a bathroom downstairs. Make yourself comfortable and enjoy the day. There is also coffee and water and snacks in the back. At this time, I want to bring up Larry Sandhouse. He has a few things he wants to share with you before we get started. Please give Larry a round of applause. All right. Thank you, James. Who had fun yesterday? You guys enjoy it? It was good? Cool. Who didn't come back? Okay. <laughs> all right. I want to remind you guys, of course, you guys got tickets, right? We got to remember, first of all, be cool. Relax. Things happen. You should see us back there. I mean... You, you, if you, you guys, every once in a while, just turn around and watch, watch us all fighting back there, because something's broken and we're not telling you. That's how we act. See, you hear that noise? That noise right there? Hear it, right? That noise right there is freaking Pedro out because he knows something's breaking. <laughs> so just be cool. Things happen. Things break. It is what it is. We'll get back to it. We'll fix it. If you're out of water, let us know. If you're, at, you know, bathrooms don't work, let us know. You know, um, you know, whatever. You know, tend to, Take care of it. Relax. It's okay. I want to remind you guys that we got prizes today. All right. We're going to give some of them out today. We're going to give some of them out uh, tomorrow. We're going to give the big prizes out tomorrow, so make sure you know it. But I got some cool stuff for you today, of course. We got the standard silver bar, right? We got the standard silver coin. Who's a Superman fan? Yeah, you guys Superman fan? Yeah, I know, right? Oh, God. Who? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Well, we have the uh, the original Superman, you know, the straight Superman. <laughs> Silver coin, we're going to be giving one of those away, too. All right? And then we got some other people giving away some other cool stuff, so make sure you know about that, too. All right? So I'm also going to let you know that Phil and I are going to be going next door. We're going to be doing a radio show while you guys are watching Print. And you know what, what the most disappointing thing about that for me is? I'm not going to be able to see Brent. The first time you see it, I'm not going to be able to watch it. I'm not going to learn anything. But I'm going to ask you all a question because I want you to watch this. And I want you to watch the Backward Bicycle movie that he's going to play. And I want to talk about it afterwards. And I want you to just watch it carefully and think about something inside it that you, that you all missed that it took me eight times to see or to, to grab. All right? So make sure you do that too. Anyway, let me bring Jamie back up here so Jamie can introduce Brett and uh, whatever. Pretty cool, right? Thank you. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Larry. Hey, can I have that clicker back? Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm trying to gather the words to say about Brent. I've seen Brent present for the last two years that he's been here. Every time he presents, I learn something new. The stuff that he's going to share with you me, Pedro, and Juliana all are involved in. So 
Brent is the money, he teaches the money multiplier method. He paid off $984,000 of debt in only 39 months. Brent is going to teach us how to increase our wealth without adding new income. Oh, wait, without, yeah, without adding new income. And he has lectured and taught thousands. So please help me welcome up Brent Kessler. Brent, I have to say, there's so many great things about you. That slide is not the best thing for you. Thank you. Appreciate you. <laughs> we'll redo that for next time. <laughs> All right. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Who in here has either heard me speak before or this is your very first time? It's going to be a long day for you, sir. <laughs> yep. So anyway, just hands up if this is the first time you've ever seen me, if you've never seen me. All right. So a few of you. All right, so anyway, I am Brent Kessler. The name of my company is The Money Multiplier. Let me get the clicker going here. Are we on, Paul? We should be good. I'm clicking. There you go. All right, Brent, just real fast before you get started, we are live oh, on Facebook. Oh, I got to stay so just, still? Yeah, they want to see Like, you. how still? How Can I Not come? Not still, but the camera's from right here there. here to here? TV screen from one side to the other? All right, because I'm a pacer. You guys know that, right? Right in here. All right, very good. I got my marching orders, so I know what to do. All right, so anyway, as Jamie said, I am Brent Kessler. The name of my company is called The Money Multiplier. I'm located down in Port Orange, Florida, about an hour east of Orlando. I bump right next up to uh, Daytona Beach. And um, anyway, the information that I'm going to go over with you today, it's, uh, again, it's going to be kind of a paradigm shift. So the stuff that I'm going to go through is going to be stuff that you have not been taught about money, have not been taught about wealth. It's not what your parents are doing. It's not what your grandparents are doing. It's not what your friends, your colleagues, and your coworkers are doing with money. So I want you to keep an open mind as I go through this because I'm going to challenge you on a lot of the things that you have been taught about money. All right, so just keep an open mind as I go through this. Now, this concept that I'm going to go over with you um, actually, the first time I heard about it was in 2006, and I was actually at a chiropractic conference. Um, yes, I am a chiropractor. I no longer practice chiropractic anymore. I had five clinics in the Kansas City area. I sold my last one in 2017, and I have not actively practiced since 2008. I had associate docs in those clinics. Um, and then after my wife and I became empty nesters, we moved to... Uh, Florida. Um, I wanted to go to Florida before that, but the kids didn't want to like be taken out of their high school. But then guess what happened after they became, like when they got done with high school and when we moved to Florida? They followed us. Yeah. I tried to tell them not, I tried to not tell them our address, but they found us. But no, I'm just kidding. So Hannah, my daughter is in the back, which is my assistant. She travels a lot. So anyway, Hannah, just put up your hand, look back at Hannah so you know who she is. Yep, a lot of you guys that are working with us, you know Hannah. Um, so anyway, this concept that I'm going to go over with you, back in 2006, I was at a chiropractic conference and I heard this information and I thought, man, that looks really, really good, but it just looks too good to be true. Have you guys ever seen something like that where it looks good, but it's just too good to be true? Well, that was me. And I saw this information, I'm like, man, it looks good, but I don't know. So after I left that conference, I just went back to my normal life and I didn't do anything with this information at all. But then I go back to another chiropractic conference almost two years later, and there's about 10 or 12 of my colleagues that were at that previous conference that are now at this conference with me. And they were just coming up to me and they were ranting and raving about, man, Brent, isn't that banking concept the most powerful thing ever to pay off debt, to build wealth, to keep control of your money? And they were just going on and on and on about it. And I thought to myself, there's no way that 10 or 12 of my closest colleagues are lying to me, right? So maybe one or two, but not 10 or 12. So I went home and I told my wife, I said, we've got to start implementing this concept in our life. And it was at that time, it was February of 2008, $984,000. $711 in debt. That's what I owe to the third-party creditors. Now, 
I know you're probably thinking, how does a guy from Kansas get to be almost a million dollars in debt? Of course, I know if you live in California or something like that, that buys you a very small house, right? But in Kansas, it buys you a lot. Well, I had my chiropractic loans from college that I owed. I had the house that I lived in. Um, I also had my clinic. I also had a house on the Lake of the Ozarks between St. Louis and Kansas City. And if you have a house on the lake, you have to have a what? A boat and a wave runner, right? You can't have a house on the lake without a boat and a wave runner, can you? No, I didn't have, I had a boat and a wave runner. And I'm also an airplane pilot, so as an airplane pilot, I had to have my own airplane, right? So it didn't take me a lot to become almost a million dollars in debt. Well, I put this concept that I'm going to share with you today, and I put that into place, and I was able to pay that off in three years and three months. I never had to work any harder, change my cash flow, take any risk or lose control. All I did was added one simple step in my financial life, and that's what I'm going to share with you today. So as I go through this, I want you to keep an open mind. Now, so the information that I'm going over with you is not like information that I necessarily created. There's a guy here, and his name is R. Nelson Nash, and he wrote this book called Becoming Your Own Banker. Now, this is a book that you definitely want to add to your wealth building library. I'm not here today to ask you to buy the book or sell you the book. I just want you to know where the information is coming from. Now, about two and a half years ago, it was March of 2019, so Nelson passed away at age 87. But this guy totally changed my financial life. The information in this book is, is so powerful. So this is definitely a book that you want to add to your wealth building library. And the thing is, is how you order it. You can go on our website and order it, themoneymultiplier.com. You can go to Amazon and order it. So, again, I don't care if you order it from me. It's just important that you get it. And if you're like me and have a little ADD going on, it also has two hours of audio to go to, right? So, anyway, that was kind of like me. I didn't want to read it. So, there's also another book that I wrote with a colleague of mine, Chris Noggle. It's called Mapping Out the Millionaire Mystery. And Chris will be speaking to you tomorrow morning. He'll be here sometime today. But, um, but uh, Chris Noggle, anyway, that is a guy that if you're not watching or if you're not kind of going through and following, okay, all the Chris Noggle stuff that he does on Facebook and Twitter and all the social media, you definitely got to watch and see what he's doing. So now, so like a lot of you may have heard of Chris Noggle before. He's very active in the housing and the real estate market. He's um, had a TV. He's had a couple TV shows. One on House Hunters. The other one, um, uh, like on the on, on the TV show HGD, HGTV. It's called Risky Builders. So Chris is very active in that arena as well. And I know there's a lot of you in here that know Chris pretty well. But he'll be speaking to you tomorrow. But uh, Chris, okay. So Chris actually was a stockbroker and he was a financial advisor for New York Life. And Chris has been my client for quite a few years now. And uh, Chris, he came to me, and he was in this business for a long time. And he came to me, and he says, man, I've never seen the concept the way that you presented it. I never knew that you could use the vehicle that I'm going to talk to you about today to build and keep and create wealth. So Chris will kind of share that story with you. But uh, Chris and I, um, I guess that book's been out about a year and a half now. Now. If uh, you guys send me an email, brent at themoneymultiplier.com, I will email you the ebook, right? The version here. I think there's some here that we have. We got like about, I don't know, seven or eight copies that um, Paul and Pedro and Jamie and Larry are going to give away. But even if you don't get one of the copies, I'll send it to you on the email version. Same thing, right? It's just an ebook. Same exact thing as a hard copy. All right. So just to be totally clear of what I'm going to be talking about for about the next hour and a half so there's no confusion at all of what the subject is all right so money is going to be our subject right that's what we're going to be talking about is money now in order to talk about money we have to all agree on what the definition is of money so if I ask you to tell me the definition of money, you guys would tell me what? Medium of exchange. This is not your first time here, is it, sir? You've been here before, right? Yes. But most people don't say that. They give me a, just a bunch of different answers, too. But exactly 
Right. That's all money is, is a means of exchange. Because all we do with money every day is what? We buy things. We exchange money for food, food for money, car for money, money for car, house for money, money for house, clothes for money, money for clothes, right? That's all money is, is a means of exchange. So that is going to be our definition of money, a means of exchange. Are you guys all right with that? Before we end today, I'm going to show you how to get all the money back on every product and service that you're ever going to buy. And I'm going to show you how to do that with a car. And if you can do it with a car, guess what else you can do it with? A boat, a bicycle, glasses, jewelry, you know, um, a computer, a cell phone. How about a house? Anybody in here into houses and real estate? How cool would it be to be able to buy the house and get the money back? How cool, uh, oh, I know, I bet there's some investor schooling students in here, yes? And you might have to pay a fee to be an investor schooling member. I don't know, I'm, I'm just guessing, right? So in other words, you have to pay to be a member, right? So how cool would it be is if you could be an investor school member, pay the fee, and get all the money back? Would that be pretty cool? So I'm going to show you how you're going to be able to do that. And I'm not going to have you change your cash flow. I'm not going to have you work any harder, take any additional risk, or lose control. All we're going to do is add one step in your financial life. That's it. One simple step. Now, the information that I'm going to go over with you today, you're going to say, I don't know, Brent. It looks all right, but it looks too good to be true. Um, that's not what I've been taught about money. So I have to get your mind right a little bit. So I'm going to play this seven-and-a-half-minute video it's called the backward bicycle, and it's a, and and again, it's just okay. It's a backward bicycle. The thing you can go is go to YouTube and just click on the backward bicycle. And after we leave here today, you can watch it again. But I'm going to play that now just to kind of get your mind right. Here we go. Hey, it's me, Destin. Welcome back to Smarter Every Day. You've heard people say it's just like riding a bike, meaning it's really easy and you can't forget how to do it, right? But I did something. I did something that damaged my mind. It happened on the streets of Amsterdam and, and I got really scared, honestly. I, I can't ride a bike like you can anymore. Before I show you the video of what happened, I, I need to tell you the backstory. Like many six-year-olds with a MacGyver mullet, I learned how to ride a bike when I was really young. I had learned a life skill and I was really proud of it. Everything changed though when my friend Barney called me 25 years later. Where I work, the welders are geniuses and they like to play jokes on the engineers. He had a challenge for me. He had built a special bicycle and he wanted me to try to ride it. He had only changed one thing. When you turn the handlebar to the left, the wheel goes to the right. When you turn it to the right, the wheel goes to the left. I thought this would be easy, so I hopped on the bike ready to demonstrate how quickly I could conquer this. And here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Destin Salem. First attempt riding the bicycle. All right. So the faster I go, the better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I couldn't do it. You can see that I'm laughing, but I'm actually really frustrated. In this moment, I had a really deep revelation. My thinking was in a rut. This bike revealed a very deep truth to me. I had the knowledge of how to operate the bike, but I did not have the understanding. Therefore, knowledge is not understanding. Look, I know what you're probably thinking. Destin's probably just an uncoordinated engineer and can't do it. But that's not the case at all. The algorithm that's associated with riding a bike in your brain is just that complicated. Think about it. Downwards force on the pedals, leaning your whole body, pulling and pushing the handlebars, gyroscopic precession in the wheels. Every single force is part of this algorithm. And if you change any one part, it affects the entire control system. I do not make definitive statements that often, but I'm telling you right now, you cannot ride this bicycle. You might think you can, but you can't. I know this because I'm often asked to speak at universities and conferences and I take the bike with me. It's always the same. People think they're gonna try some trick or they're just gonna power through it. It doesn't work. Your brain cannot handle this. For instance, this guy. I offered him $200 just to ride this bike 10 feet across the stage. Everybody thought he could do it. No, 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 no. No, you didn't understand. You didn't understand. So, this way. No, no, okay. All right, I'm sick. All right, so, uh, whatever you're in. Yeah. Wait, wait. No, no, you have to keep your feet on. Dude, all right, here we go. Touch. <laughs> Like, you gotta start rolling at least. Go. And go. Oh, go. Right, back up. Okay, well, keep your feet on the pedal. Go. Go right off. Keep your feet on the pedals. 
Once you have a rigid way of thinking in your head, sometimes you cannot change that, even if you want to. So here's what I did. It was a personal challenge. I stayed out here in this driveway and I practiced about five minutes every day. My neighbors made fun of me. I had many wrecks, but after eight months, this happened. One day I couldn't ride the bike and the next day I could. It was like I could feel some kind of pathway in my brain that was now unlocked. It was really weird though. It's like there's this trail in my brain, but if I wasn't paying close enough attention to it, my brain would easily lose that neural path and jump back onto the old road it was more familiar with. Any small distractions at all, like a cell phone ringing in my pocket, would instantly throw my brain back to the old control algorithm and I would wreck. But at least I could ride it. My son is the closest person to me genetically and he's been riding a normal bike for three years. That's over half his life. I wanted to know how long it would take him to learn how to ride a backwards bike, so I told him if he learned how to ride a backwards bike, he could go with me to Australia and meet a real astronaut. Are you going to give up? No. Go ahead. This is how it starts. Look at this. This is such a big deal. Get up. You got it. Did you see his brain get it? So he in, how many weeks have we been doing this? Two weeks? In two weeks, he did something that took me eight months to do, which demonstrates that a child has more neuroplasticity, am I even saying that right, than an adult. It's clear from this experiment that children have a much more plastic brain than adults. That's why the best time to learn a language is when you're a young child. All right, today's bike log. I can ride smooth, I can ride fast. I'm thinking the experiment is over. Okay, now I'm in Amsterdam, a city that has more bicycles than people. The question is, can I ride a normal bike now? I mean, I've spent all this time unlearning how to ride a bike. If I go back and try to ride a normal one, will my brain mess up? So I've tweeted a Smarter Every Day meetup, if you will, and I'm gonna see if somebody brings a bicycle and I'm gonna try to ride a normal bike. It's backwards, it's backwards. This was one of the most frustrating moments of my life. I had ridden a normal bike since I was six, but in this moment, I couldn't do it anymore. I had set out to prove that I could free my brain from a cognitive bias. But at this point, I'm pretty sure that all I proved is that I could only redesignate that bias. So what you're not seeing is just a group of people here looking at me, looking at the strange American <laughs> that can't ride a bike because they think I'm dumb. But I'm actually two levels deep into this because I've learned and unlearned. All right. After 20 minutes of making a fool out of myself, suddenly my brain clicked back into the old algorithm. I can't explain it, but it happened in a very specific moment. <laughs> I got it, I got it, I got it. I'm back. Oh, it clicked, it clicked. hold it, it clicked. I got it, I got it. Okay, there it is. There was the moment. Okay, I can ride a bike. I tried to explain this to the people around me and they just didn't get it. They thought I was faking the previous 20 minutes and I couldn't get anybody to believe me. That looked like I faked that, didn't it? Yeah. Just a fake. Yeah. You think I'm faking, you don't believe me. That looks so weird to like, no, 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 no. You think I'm lying, don't you? Yeah, I'm not lying. I felt like the only person on the planet who had ever unlearned how to ride a bike and I couldn't articulate it to anyone because everybody just knew that you can't forget how to ride a bike. So I learned three things from this experiment. I learned that welders are often smarter than engineers. I learned that knowledge does not equal understanding. And I learned that truth is truth, no matter what I think about it. So be very careful how you interpret things because you're looking at the world with a bias, whether you think you are or not. I'm Destin, you're getting smarter every day. Have a good one. Okay, if you wanna support The backward bicycle, pretty cool, huh? Yeah? So the reason I show you that is because the stuff I'm going to go over with you today is going to be outside of the box. It's going to be kind of a paradigm shift. So I want you just to keep an open and mind one of the as I go through this information. Now, there's a guy named Will Rogers, and here's what Will Rogers says. He says, the problem in America isn't so much what people don't know. It's what people think they know that just ain't so. So a lot of the things that you've been taught about money may not actually be the truth. So just, again, I'm going to keep reminding you, keep an open mind. And as I go through this for the next hour or so, um, I know you're going to have questions. And I've done this a lot. I've talked on this subject a lot for almost 10 years now. 10 years in March is how long I've been talking on this topic. So I know the questions the majority of you guys are going to have, and I will probably answer most of them before I get done. But 
I want to make sure I get all your questions answered. So if a question comes to your mind, I'm not going to answer it as I'm going through this, but I will take them at the end. But don't try to keep the questions in your head because you will forget them. So write them down so we can make sure we get them answered. I always say a short pencil is way better than a long memory, right? So write the questions down. All right, we're going to talk about how your money flows. We're going to talk about the method to get all your money back. And as I said before we end, I'm going to show you how to get every dollar back on every car you're going to buy, drive, and own for the rest of your life. So anyway, here's what that means. So I, I don't even know a lot of you people in here, but I know how you buy a car. There's only one of three ways that you buy a car. You either pay cash for it, you bank finance it, or you lease it. Because you all look like a because all of you look very honest, and I'm sure you didn't steal the car, right? All except for maybe Tommy here. He's a little shady. But, you, but the majority of you all look honest, right? So you didn't steal the car. So that's how you had to buy the car. So the thing you had to do is you had to take your money, and you had to take the money and give it to the car dealer. They gave you the car, right? And you gave them the money. And everybody walks home happy. Everybody's happy with the transaction. But I'm going to show you how not only can you buy the car, so what you're going to do is give the car dealer the dollars. They're going to give you the car, but now we have a system, a process, and a concept to get all of that money back. Would that be pretty cool? Yeah? All right. Now, we're going to talk about the mysteries of money. We're going to talk about the machine. Now, there's a specific machine that we're going to use to build our wealth. And I'm going to show you that in just a few minutes. And it's going to surprise a lot of you of what that is, because you're going to say, how can you possibly use that to build wealth? But you'll see. We'll talk about the mission, the marathon. This is not a sprint. It's not a get rich quick deal. This is something you're going to want to add into your financial life. Just one step is all you're going to do is just add this one step in your financial life. So again, I don't want you to change anything that you're doing now. I don't want you to change your cash flow. I don't want you to work any harder, take any additional risk, or lose control. We're just going to add one simple step in our life. We'll talk about the millionaire and the movement. All right, I've got three calculators up here on the screen. I want you to look at the one on the right that says savings account at the bank. It could be your savings or your checking account. I'm going to assume... Almost all of you in here have either a checking account or a savings account at your local bank. And I'll assume you guys are all from Langhorne, Pennsylvania, so you bank at Langhorne, Pennsylvania, the Bank of Langhorne, Pennsylvania. I'm from Florida, so I bank at the Bank of Florida, right? Tommy's from Buffalo, so you bank at the Bank of Buffalo, right? So, again, I'm just going to assume that you have $25,000 in that account. All right, you with me? And I'm going to say you found a really, really good bank, and that account's paying you 4% interest on your money, right? Are all your banks giving you 4% interest right now? Yeah, okay. I know, I know they're not, but I'm going to say you found a really good one, and they're giving you 4%. I'm going to be your banker at your local bank. So we'll just call me Banker Brent, all right? And you come into the bank because you want to take the $25,000 out of the account that's earning 4%, and you want to go buy a car for $25,000. So the thing that you want to do is take those dollars out of the bank and go pay cash for the car. And I say, no, no, no. You don't want to take the $25,000 out of the bank that's paying you 4% to go pay cash for the car. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make you a loan of $25,000, and I'm going to charge you 6% interest to buy the car. Now, so let's say we all go down and we're going to borrow money to buy a car, 25000 So normally, how long do we take the loan for? 10 years? How? What'd you say? 60 months? I heard seven years, four years. Let's go with five years or 60 months. It doesn't matter if it's four years or 48 or six years or 72 months. All right? In this example, we're going to use five years or 60 months. So here's what I'm saying. I want you to keep your money in the bank that's earning 4%, the $25,000, all right? And I'm going to make you a loan of $25,000, and I'm going to charge you 6% interest. And over the same equal time period, in this case, five years or 60 months, our bank will pay you more money 
on the 4% that you're earning than you will pay on the 6% that you're borrowing. So in other words, is it possible to make more money earning 4 at the same time you're paying 6 over the same equal time period? I see you guys back there shaking your head no, because you're saying, no, Brent, how can you make money earning 4 and paying 6? If I do that, I'm losing 2%. Well, that's the way my mind thought, too, when I was sitting in your chair for the first time about 15 years ago in 2006. I said, there's no way if I earn four and pay six, I'm losing two. Well, the banker told you the truth, and let's walk through it. So if you take 25000 at 6% for five years, that means your monthly payment is going to be four eighty three thirty two a month. If we take four eighty three thirty two times 60, your total payment is going to be almost $29,000 for that car. You're going to pay $25,000 in principal and about $4,000 in interest over that 60 months. Are you guys with me? That same money that I told you to keep in the bank, earning 4% over the five years or 60 months, you're actually going to have a total of $30,525. Now here is my question. Is this number 3525? Is that a larger number than 28999? Or do you guys in Langhorn do math differently than I do in Florida? It's a bigger number, right? Well, how can that be? How can you have more money earning four at the same time you're paying six over the same equal time period? Here's what's happening the car balance is going down, right? The car payment, the car balance is going down. You're paying it down each month. But the money that's in the bank that's earning the four is going up each month, right? So one goes down and the other one goes up. But our minds are not programmed to think that way because the thing that we think is if we earn four and pay six, that we're losing two. We have to start learning how money actually works. Now, the same thing happens here is if I would change that number to 10%, so basically I'm earning 10% and I'm paying 20% interest. The same thing works. I can make more money earning 10 at the same time I'm paying 20. But all I want to prove to you today is that you can make money all day long earning four at the same time you're paying six. Are you good with that, right? Now, why is that important? Well, there's a method to my madness here. Why is it important that you can make money earning four at the same time you're paying six? Well, let's talk about the machine that we're going to use to build our wealth. Are you ready? It's going to surprise a lot of you guys. The machine that we're going to use to build our wealth is a whole life insurance policy in a mutual company that pays dividends. Now, I wish you could be standing where I'm at right now, and I wish you could see some of your faces, because you guys are looking at me like, what? a whole life insurance policy to build wealth, why on earth would we ever do that? I know everything there is to know about whole life insurance, and I would never use that vehicle to build wealth. Well, let me just tell you, you don't know everything there is to know about the vehicle, because if you did, you would be implementing this in your life. But why do you think that we would want to use a whole life policy to build wealth? Any ideas? Why would we want to do it? You're borrowing from yourself. You can be your own banker. Great. Accumulated cash value. Yep, all those are great answers. But the reason... Oh, Paul's going to tell us. Well, I was going to say you build it tax-free, too. You build it tax-free as well. Yep. All Compound interest. All those are great answers. But the reason we're doing this is because this is what the rich do. This is what the wealthy do. As a matter of fact, number one purchasers of whole life insurance in the world are conventional banks. Conventional banks own more in whole life insurance than all of their land and their buildings combined. As a matter of fact, since 2013, conventional banks have quadrupled the amount of whole life insurance that they purchase. Now, why do you think conventional banks are buying so much whole life insurance? Is it because they're stupid? or they know something the rest of us don't know. They know something. So all we're going to do is mimic and imitate exactly what they're doing. 
So this concept that I'm going to talk to you about today, this whole banking concept, so all of it is not brand new. It's not on trial. It's not being tested. It's been around for over 200 years. The Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, the Morgans, the Stanleys, the Barclays. This is how, okay, so this is how they built wealth and kept wealth in their family. It's how Walt Disney built Disneyland. It's how Ray Kroc funded McDonald's. It's how Pampered Chef got started before Warren Buffett bought Pampered Chef. So it's not on trial. It's not being tested. All we're going to do is mimic and imitate exactly what they do. We're just going to do what they've been doing for a couple hundred years. Now, keep in mind, this is not any life insurance policy. It's not any whole life insurance policy. It is a specifically designed, specially engineered whole life policy that has high immediate cash value. And my definition of immediate is within 30 days. So this is not a life insurance policy that you can go out and have your brother-in-law that sells life insurance say, hey, I heard this guy Brent speak. I want to buy one of these policies. Okay, Mr. Brother-in-law? Because all of you guys have a brother-in-law that sells life insurance, right? I mean, almost everyone in here has a brother-in-law. Everyone sells life insurance. No, this is a specifically designed, specially engineered, high cash value policy. All right? It's not an index policy. It's not a term policy. It's not a universal. It's not a variable. It is a whole life policy in a mutual company that pays dividends. Now, how can you, okay, so how can you know that banks are the number one purchasers of whole life insurance in the world? Don't take my word for it. Go out and Google something called BOLI, B-O-L-I. It stands for Bank Owned Life Insurance. If you go out there and Google it, you will see the hundreds of pages that come up on how much whole life insurance conventional banks own. So we're just going to mimic and imitate exactly what they do. Now, let's go back to the 4 and the 6%. Why is that important? There's a method to my madness. I wanted to prove to you that you can make money all day long earning four and paying six. Well, the reason being is, is, the, is just because inside of this policy, the guaranteed growth is 4% into the policy. That's the growth inside of the policy. When, so the thing is, when you put money into the policy, it has a growth factor. Not me telling you what it is, it is in your policy contract. So that growth factor is 4% is the guarantee, plus dividends, plus dividends. So if the company pays dividends, which they're not guaranteed, but every company I use has been paying dividends for over 120 plus consecutive years without fail. So do you think there's a pretty good chance they're going to pay dividends this year, next year, 10 years from now? Absolutely, right? But if they don't, let's just use the 4%. Now, on that growth inside of the policy, is that taxable 4% or is it tax-free? What do you think? Tax-free. And tell me what your largest eroder of wealth is. Taxes. That's right. Now, why is the 6% important? Because 6% is the highest interest rate the insurance company is going to charge you to take a loan. So can we make money all day long earning 4 and paying 6 are we good with that? Yes. All right. Now, so who in here believes in compound interest? Most every hand goes up, right? So, so who, uh, yep, people say, I believe in compound interest. We've all been taught compound interest is a great thing. However, the only way compound interest works is if your product or your money sits still, yes? So in other words, if I want this $20 bill to earn compound interest, I have to take it down to the bank teller, for example, and I got to put it into the bank, and it's going to compound. It's going to earn interest, right? So it's got to sit still. If I go get that $20 bill out, say in a week, a month, or a year, it's no longer compounding. So compounding stops the motion of your money. And motion is a natural law of God, is it not? Everything is in motion. My lips are moving, my eyes are twitching, my right, so my hands are moving. I'm walking back and forth. All of you guys probably ate breakfast this morning, so your food's going to be in motion throughout your body pretty soon. Yeah? The cars are out there driving and by, the birds are flying, the airplanes are flying, right? Everything is in motion. Who in here, okay, I want to ask you a question. Who in here went to the grocery store earlier this week or this past weekend and went and bought fresh produce 
that you do not intend on eating. No, you would never buy fresh produce that you do not intend on eating because if you don't eat it and keep it in motion, it rots and spoils, does it not? Who, would, who in here wants to eat fish out of a stagnant pond? Anybody? No. So everything is in motion, but compounding stops the motion. Now, here's a question for you. We've all been taught compounding is a great thing for our money. I want you to name me one business in the world. Pick any business you want. Name me one business in the world that actually uses compound interest. Banks. People say banks use compound interest, right? Well, let's talk about that. Okay, do banks use compound interest? No. They pay you compound interest, and they charge you compound interest, but they don't use it themselves. And here's what I mean. If I took this $20 bill and I highlighted it in yellow, and I put my initials on it, and I took it down to the Bank of Langhorne, Pennsylvania, I give it to the bank teller. Does the bank teller take my $20 bill, and do they take it to the back room, and there's a little box there that says Brent Kessler, and that's where they put that $20 bill? No. As a matter of fact, if I want to go get this $20 bill, the same one back out in a month, are they going to give me the same $20 bill? In a week? In a day? In an hour? In 15 minutes? No. Why aren't they going to give me the same $20 bill back? Because the money's in motion, right? Right? So it's constantly moving. The money is constantly moving. How much money does a grocery store make if groceries are compounding on the shelf, if nobody's buying them? Zero. How much money does a car dealer make if nobody's buying cars? How much money does a hotel make if nobody's staying in a hotel? How much money does the airplane make if nobody's staying in the airplane? How much money does the iPhone people, the computer, the Mac people, whoever, make if nobody's buying computers and iPhones? How much money do you make in your business if your products or services are not in motion? You guys are in real estate, right? You buy houses, you flip houses, people move in, they move out, you rent them, right? I mean, everything is in motion. You rehab them, fix them, right? So not one business in the world actually uses compounding or compound interest. However, isn't it strange that all the major institutions that promote it, banks, Wall Street, mutual funds, insurance companies, they all tell us to park our money with them, leave it sit still? If it was so good to let your money compound, why aren't they doing it themselves? I'm just trying to get you to think. Let's go one extra step. Who in here has an IRA, 401k, or qualified plan? Go ahead, just keep the hands up. IRA, 401k, qualified plan. All right, keep them up. Keep them up. All right, sir, can I ask you, okay, so how old are you? 58, all right, and how long have you been putting money in that 401k, IRA, or qualified plan? Not long. Not long. Okay. How long has... Okay, anyway, so give me another hand. So, so how long have you been... No, that's okay. I, I, I'll get there. About 20 years. How long have you been putting it in? And how old are you? 52? Okay, 58, 20 years, not long, 20 years, right? All right. And the reason you're putting money in there is why? Because you want more later. You're putting money away... So you're going to have more later in those plans, right? Because that's what our parents did, our grandparents, our friends, our colleagues, and our coworkers. Well, let me ask you about the money that you're putting in there. Are there any guarantees that money is going to be there when you go to get it out? No. Well, there is one guarantee. It's guaranteed to never go below zero. But how exciting would that be if that actually happened? Wouldn't that suck? And who's controlling that money? Is it you or somebody else? Somebody else is controlling it. And how long do you have to leave the money in there before you can go get it out without paying the penalty? 59 and a half. So you've been putting it in for 20 years, you're 52. So for 20 years you've been putting it in and you still have to wait another seven or eight years to get it out, right? Now, even when you get the money out, the thing you still have to pay tax on it, right? So all you're avoiding is the penalty. Now, I want to ask you a few questions about that, all right? There's no guarantees, we said. Somebody else controls it. Oh, I'll ask you this. Tell me everything you know about your 401K, your IRA, your qualified plan. Tell me everything you know about that account. Wait, hang on. I'll tell you what you know. 
The thing that you know, one of two things. The thing that you know is if, is if that account goes up or down based on the quarterly statement that you get. And you may know if it goes um, like, okay, so like as far as if it's in a low, moderate, or high risk category. But other than that, you guys don't know crap about that retirement plan, do you? Now, there's a couple of you that may know a little more, but most of you don't really know much about what's going on in that plan. All right, now, I want to ask you a few questions because you guys are putting money in here. Is a dollar worth more today or in the future? Today, and if you ever think about that, I want you to think about how many candy bars you could buy 25 years ago for a dollar and how many you could buy today. I stopped at the Wawa the other night, and I bought a Snicker bar, and that thing was $2.79 for a Snicker bar. Now, I got the king size, of course, but still, $2.79. All right, so yeah, a dollar is worth more today than it is in the future, right? Are taxes going to go up or go down? The history has been that they go up, right? The President of the United States campaigned on increasing taxes. Now, look. I don't really care who the president was. Uh, again, I think taxes had to go up like either way regardless because someone's got to pay for all the crap that's been going on for the last year and a half. I think they're just going to go up way at a much more higher rapid pace with um, – anyway, that's another subject. <laughs> if you have a choice to pay tax on the small amount of the seed or the large amount of the harvest, which one do you want to pay tax on? The seed. I agree with all of those answers, but you are violating all of those answers by putting your money in a 401k, an IRA qualified plan, because what you're doing is giving up good dollars today to get paid back with non-guaranteed weaker dollars in the future. You're compounding the tax, and then, all right, and then the thing is, is that when you do pay the tax, you're going to pay it on the higher amount and not the smaller amount. I'm just trying to get you to think about what's going on with your money. I'm not telling you you're doing the wrong thing. I just want you to think about it. Let's go one step deeper. Let's say we all leave here today and we go to the grocery store and we buy a loaf of bread and a gallon of milk. Are you going to wait 5, 10, 15, 20, 27, 28 years to eat that bread or drink that milk? That would be crazy, wouldn't it? What if we go buy a car or a house today? Are you going to wait 5, 10, 15, 27 years to drive that car or move in the house? That would be ridiculous. So why are you doing that with your money? You see, people do things with money they would never do with things that money buys. You would never go buy a loaf of bread, bring it home, put it in the freezer, and wait 10, 15, 20, 25 years to eat it, would you? But you'll put money in a 401k, an IRA, or qualified plan, and wait and hope to get more in the future. Oh, but you tell me, Brent, I get a match. If I put that money in there, my company matches it. All right, well, let's assume you get a match. But how can the match be guaranteed if the principal is not guaranteed, right? Am I doing something wrong, guys? Give me the buzz up here, the beep beep. All right, so I'm just trying to get you to think, right? Okay, but now I'll go with your theory, and let's say that you get a match, right? A one-to-one -one match. So that would mean is if you went to the store and bought a loaf of bread, you brought the bread home, you put it in the freezer, you open up the freezer 10, 15, 20 years later, and guess what's in there? Two loaves of bread. How much better is that second loaf of bread going to taste coming out of that freezer in 20 years? It'll still be freezer burned, right? I'm just trying to get you to think about what is actually going on. Now, I want to ask you one other thing. I want you guys... No, I already asked you that. I got one other thing. I want you to think of everybody you know at retirement age. Think of everybody you know, and it could be you in the room. Think of everybody you know at retirement age. I want you to tell me how many people that you've ever met at retirement age that are totally happy, ecstatic, elated, joyful, delightful, excited about how the retirement plan is performed for them. Come on, one of you? Not one? There's got to be one, there's one or two. Not, not one. That's surprising. There's usually one. That's right. See, you guys don't know people like that, or if you do, it's very few, because you all know people that are out there in the workforce at retirement age, not because they want to be, but they have to be for survival. 
because those plans, that 401k, IRA, qualified plan, the pension, did not turn out the way that they thought. So I'm just trying to get you to think about what's going on. Let's talk about how a bank works. This is how your bank works right here in Langhorne, Pennsylvania, the same way mine works down in Port Orange, Florida. The thing that you do is you put money into the bank. I'm going to say you're going to put $100,000 into the bank. Don't worry about the amount. It could be $100. It could be a million dollars. Okay? The most important thing is that it's your money that you put in there. Now, I'm going to say you found a really good bank, and that bank is going to pay you 4% interest on the money when you make a deposit. I know they're not, but you found the good bank. Now, every time you put money into that bank, that money becomes a liability to the bank, does it not? Because they owe you interest, right? The bank has to pay you interest. So it's a liability to them. Well, how does the bank take your money and turn it into an asset? They loan it out to other people. That's, that's what banks do. They're in the lending business, right? A loan is an asset to a bank, is it not? But every time we think of a loan, guess what we think of a loan as? A payment, a debt, an expense, a liability. We have to start thinking of a loan as an asset. Because here's what you do with your money, okay? I don't even know you, but I know what you do. You guys take your money and you go put it in the bank. I don't care where it came from. It could be active income, passive income, investment income. It could be a check in the mail from grandma for your birthday, right? So the thing you do is you take that money and you put it in somebody else's bank. And then guess what you do? You go back to the bank and you say, Mr. Banker, I want to borrow some of those dollars I put in that bank to go buy a house. Who in here besides myself has ever went to a bank to borrow money to buy a house? A lot of you, right? So now what we do, okay, the thing, we go back to the bank and say, I want to borrow some money to buy a house. And the bank's going to loan you the money and I'm just going to call it, we'll call it 7% interest. Don't get hung up on the interest. I just want you to get the concept. Well, if you borrow money from a bank to buy a house, are you expected to pay the bank back with interest? Yeah, you are. So who's in control of that transaction? The bank, right? Now, who in here besides myself has ever went to a bank to borrow money for a car? Anybody? A few of you? So now you go borrow money for a car. We'll call that 8% interest, all right? If you borrow money from a bank to buy a car, are you expected to pay them back with interest? Yes. Because if you don't, what will they do? They'll come pick it up. Now, that is not a lie. I had a car repossessed one time. I was, um, it, was, it was back just in the very first time I was living in Daytona Beach. But I was actually in my apartment. And I had a little job and stuff. And I was doing my job. And I had car payments. And um, I was like, man, I'm going to skip this car payment. You know, because my friends want to party this weekend. So I'm going to skip the car payment. So I skipped one, and then I still wanted to party the next weekend. And I wanted to party for three or four, you know, weeks or months. And so I didn't pay the car payment. I just said, you know, I stopped paying the car payment. They called me, you know, sent me a, a thing in the mail. So I go back to my apartment. It's in Holly Hill, Florida. It's right next to Ormond Beach. And um, it was pretty late at night. I want to say 1 o'clock in the morning, and I heard some noise out front. And I peeked out the blinds. And all I saw was my car on the ass end of a tow truck, and it was going the other way. They weren't lying. If you don't pay for the car, they come and get it. Now, I don't know how many times I've told you guys this here, but guess what kind of car that was that I got repossessed? It was a Renault Alliance, which is one of the biggest pieces of crap car that's ever made. I, got, I managed to get one repossessed. But they came and got it because I didn't pay for it. So make your car payments, or they'll come and get the car. All right, so if you borrow money from a car, you got to pay the bank back with interest, right? How about if you want to do a home remodel, a new granite countertops, a swimming pool? You guys are in real estate. You take a home equity line of credit, right? Maybe you want new kitchen cabinets, a pool, an outside deck, whatever, right? You're doing a fix and flip. So you borrow the money from the bank. We'll call it 9%. Well. If you borrow it, you got to pay them back, don't you, with interest. So who's in control of all of these transactions so far? The bank. So can you see all the banks are doing? They take the money in, send it out. Bring it in, send it out. Send it in, bring it out. So that's why this $20 bill that I have highlighted in yellow with my initials on it that I gave to the bank, 
is no longer there when I go back and get it because they're keeping it in motion. So finally, we're going to do a debt consolidation loan, pay off all the credit cards at 12%. The money's got to go back in the banking system. So again, who's in control of every one of these transactions? The bank, right? Now, let's do a little math. I know it's early on a Saturday morning, but I'll keep the math or try to keep it easy. So remember, I said you found a really good bank that's paying you 4% interest on your money. Well, you go to the bank and you say, I want to borrow money to buy a house. So you're going to borrow that money from the bank, which is the depositor's money that they put in there. And the bank's going to loan that to you at seven. So if the bank made seven and you made four, how much more do they make than you? Three. Seven minus four is three. Well, how about the car? On the car, they made eight. You made four. How much do they make than you? How much more do they make than you? Four. Right? Pretty simple math. What about nine minus four on the home remodel? Five. And then finally, the debt consolidation. They made 12. You made four. How much more do they make? Eight. So the bank made 20% and you made 4%, right? The bank made 20 and you made 4. How much more did the bank make than you? 16%, right? 20 minus 4 is 16. Close. What about 500% more than you? Because see, if you made $4 and the bank made $20, didn't they make five times the amount that you made? 500% more. Banks are making between 400 and 1300 percent on the money that you leave there each and every year. Now, I know you guys are thinking, well, Brent, how do I really know that's true? I hear you flapping your gums and moving your lips, but how do I really know banks make that much money on me? Well, don't take my word for it. Go out and just find something called BauerFinancial.com, B A U E R, BauerFinancial.com. And you can plug in any bank that you want. A big bank we all know the names of, a small little hometown bank. And you will see that banks make no less, no less than 400% annually on the money you leave there. I don't care if you get their report from this year, last year, 20 years ago. Now, I travel and I teach this all over the country. And I always ask you guys this. I say, I'm going to challenge you to go find a bank that makes less than 400% annually on the money that you leave there. And if you can show me one, I will change my presentation. Nobody has showed me that yet, and I've been speaking on this for, it'll be 10 years in March. So maybe you'll be the first group that shows me one. But if you think about it, that just makes sense, doesn't it? Because the bank that you bank with, is there just one branch or are there multiple branches? Multiple. And they're everywhere, right? I don't care where you live. Langhorne, Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, Buffalo, Florida. We can all get in the car. We can all drive down the main section of town. And we get to the stoplight. And there's four corners of that stoplight, yes? And tell me what at least one building is on one of those corners that you usually see. A bank. Are the banks on the bad location? Are they, right? Do they have bad landscaping? Bad architecture? Or are they in the nicest buildings in town? They're the nicest buildings in town. Have you ever been driving down the road and you see, oh, well, here's a new building. Something's coming up here on this lot. I wonder what it's going to be, a restaurant, a bar, a specialty shop. I wonder what it's going to be. And then you drive back there three weeks later, and what is it? Another bank, right? And then when you walk in the bank, aren't they all nice inside? You know, and, and, two, and, and then, too, just a lot of times, okay, like when you go to the bank, they give you stuff, right? They'll give you cookies and coffee and soda, right? There's a bank at our town so that if you go there on a certain day of the week, they give you wine. They give you wine. If you go in there on a certain day of the week, you get wine. So guess what day my wife goes to the bank three or four times a day? Yeah, that's why she's not here today. She's hung over. You went to the bank. I'm just kidding, sir. That really didn't happen. Just a joke. All right, so again, all right, so who's getting all of your money? All of these transactions, the bank is in control, right? How much risk did the bank take to do all of this? Zero, almost, right? Because whose money did they use? They used your money. Now, I will agree that the interest rate offsets the risk. The higher risk that you are as a borrower, your interest rate will be higher. But if you're too high of a risk, are they going to loan you the money anyway? No. All I want you to do 
is to be the banker in your own life because you're doing all this anyway. Right now, you guys are buying houses, cars, you're doing house remodels, you're using credit cards. Where is all of your money going? I mean, right, so like, you guys ever think, like, where in the heck did all my money go? You know, there's more month than money, right? All right, there it is, BauerFinancial.com. So if you find one, I'll change my presentation. Banks make 400 to 1,300%. All right, I'm going to skip through this part, but I will show you how you can watch the one that I the skip through later. Now, all of you guys have this handout, right? The money multiplier handout. So everything I'm going to go over the rest of the way is in this handout. It would be better if you watch the screen, but I don't want to tell you how to learn this stuff. It would be better if you watch the screen and go home and study the handout in nauseating detail later, all right? But if you want to follow through on the handout and that's better, that's okay too. It's totally up to you. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how you're going to get every dollar back for every car you're going to buy, drive, and own for the rest of your life. So not only are you going to get the car, but you're also going to get the money back as well. Would that be pretty cool if you got the car and the money? Yeah? All right. So you're 58 years old, and um, I'm going to guess you started driving when you were about 16. So you've been driving for about 42 years, give or take a year or two, right? Now, the very first car that you bought and you started driving back when you were 16 or so, is that a car that you still have today? What about your second car? Are you married? Okay, and I'm sure your wife probably drives a car. Is she driving her first? Second. At 58, do you have children? Yep, they might drive. I mean, I'm about your same age, and I got a one that's 32, 22, and 20, and they drive. So they probably went through a car or two, right? Out of all of those cars you've ever bought, driven, and owned for you and your family, oh, wait, before I ask you that, the car you're driving today is probably not the last car you're ever going to buy, right? You're probably going to buy another one. Your wife will buy another one. Your kids, grandkids, or future grandkids, they'll buy cars, right? So you're going to continue to go through life and buy cars just like you've been going through life and buying cars, right? Out of all the cars you've ever bought, driven, and owned up to this point in your life today, how much of the money do you have for every one of those cars? Here's a hint. Zero. So if I do nothing else but show you how to get part or all of the money back for every car you're going to buy for you and your family for the rest of your life and not only get the car but get the money back, would that be pretty cool? Would that be worth the price of admission? Right? All right. Let's see what happens. Now, remember what the machine is that we're going to use to build our wealth? It's a whole life policy and a mutual company that pays dividends. So we have to pay premium into the policy to have this policy. Now, in this example, it's going to be $10,000. You see up there where it says premium deposit? It's going to be $10,000 a year. Now, a couple of you are already freaking out and saying, my gosh, $10,000 a year into a whole life policy? I would never do that, Brent. Okay, well, that's okay. Then take off a zero. Put in 1000 bucks a year. Put in $200 a month. A couple of you are saying, $10,000, that's not enough. I need to put in $100,000 a year. Okay, add a zero. It's totally up to you. I will never, ever, ever tell you how much to put into your policy, ever. Have I ever told you guys how much to put into your policy? Paul, have I ever told you how much to put into yours, right? Whoever I work in, with in here, which is a few of you, have I ever told you guys how much to work with? Jamie, Pedro, zero, right? So you're going to tell me the amount you want to put in, okay? Whatever that number is. I have people that put in $200 a month and people that put in $3 million a year. Pick a number in between there, all right? And we'll be good. All right. No, now, so the premium. When we send money to the life insurance company, it's a premium payment that we're making, right? Because we're sending them money, so it's a payment. However, if it's going into an account that you control and you have cash value to use immediately, and my definition of immediately is within 30 days, is it treated more like a payment or a deposit? A deposit. And what word do you like better, payment or deposit? Have you ever made too many deposits in your bank account? For some reason, all of the ladies always say no really loud. All right. No, you don't. Age doesn't matter, and death benefit doesn't matter. Yes, it is a whole life policy. Yes, you're going to have a death benefit. But we're not meeting here today to talk about age and death benefit. We're meeting here today to talk about the cash 
that's in the policy. All right. So if you notice, age and death benefit on this screen up here is grayed out. So you don't have to worry about age and death benefit at all. All right. Now, because I told you not to worry about age and death benefit, there's at least two or three of you in the room that are very analytical and you're like, Brent, you got to tell me about age and death benefit or I won't hear anything else you say. All right, let's talk about it real quick. So let's just say we have three people. They're all in equal health, age 20, 40, and 60, okay? They're all going to walk into the same life insurance store today at the same time, and they're going to put in $10,000 into their policy. They're all in equal health. The only thing different is their age. Who's going to have the most death benefit? The youngest one, who's going to have the least death benefit? The oldest one. That just makes sense. But let's say we all walk into this. Wait, hang on. Before I do that, because this always confuses some people. Some people say, well, I'm not going to be able just to do this because my health isn't great. And yes, if your health is uninsurable, you can't buy a policy on your own body. Okay. Like if you told me you had cancer, you're probably not going to get a policy. If you told me you just had four feet of your intestines removed, you're not going to get a policy. If you had two driving while intoxicated in the last six months, you're probably not going to get a policy, right? So there's certain things that are going to eliminate you from getting the policy. However, does that mean that you can't do this? No, because you can own a policy on somebody else. A spouse, a child, a grandchild, a niece, a nephew, somebody you have a business interest in. So just because you're not insurable doesn't mean you can't have a policy. I have a colleague of mine that was diagnosed with leukemia in 2006. They gave him 90 days to live. He owns 107 of these policies. He hasn't bought any since 2006 on himself, right? Now, even though he was diagnosed and they gave him 90 days to live, he'll go back now to get his testing done for his blood cells and he has less leukemia cells in his body that, than a person that's not diagnosed with leukemia. But because they tagged him with the diagnosis, he's always got it. It's kind of like luggage. You know, it never it stays around forever. So let's say if we had two people, right? Let's say if you had a twin brother, okay? And, and you guys are the same age because you're twins. And let's say you are the super preferred Olympic athlete and your twin brother is the overweight tobacco smoker. And you guys are going to go put in $10,000 to the same company into a policy. Who's going to get the most death benefit? The super Olympic athlete would get more death benefit than the overweight tobacco smoker. But cash doesn't matter. And let me give you the example just to clear it up. So like both you and your twin brother have a $20 bill, or okay, or those three people I mentioned, age 20, 40, and 60, they're all different ages. They all walk into the grocery store with a $20 bill. Same grocery store, same time. Who's going to be able to buy the most groceries with that $20? All the same. It doesn't matter age, doesn't matter health, the color of your skin, the language you speak, how good you look, how bad you dress, whatever. The same $20 buys the same amount of groceries. So cash is not affected by your age and your health. Are you with me? I'm driving this home because every time I do this, there's somebody at the end that says, man, I wish I was younger. I wish I was in better health. It doesn't matter. The health, the age doesn't matter. As long as we have an insurable body, whether it's your body or somebody else's body that you can place a policy on, it doesn't matter. The cash is going to be the same for all of those individuals. You guys good with that? All right. On this left-hand side of this column is just time. Year 1 to 8, year 9 to 13, and so on. And even in your handout, it goes longer. Then you have age and death benefits, which we talked about. And I said the thing we're going to do is we're going to put $10,000 a year into this policy, and we're going to pay it for seven years. Now, in real life, you would never, ever, ever want to stop paying the premium in your policy, and you'll see that before I end today. But in this case, we're going to do it for seven years, okay? Now, the thing we're going to do is we're going to go buy a car from the money out of that policy at the end of the third year, beginning of the fourth year. We're going to buy a $25,000 car. Now, in real life, you would never wait to go buy the car or start using the money 
at the end of the third year, beginning of the fourth year. I want you to start using your money immediately. See the cash value in year one? I want you to use that immediately. And how soon is immediately? Within 30 days. And just know if you use it immediately and you play Honest Banker with yourself, the numbers are only going to get bigger. They're only going to go up. All right. So we put in 10000 a year for, okay, for seven years. We go buy the car for 25000 Now, the thing we're going to do after we borrow the money, okay, to buy the car for 25000 what we're going to do is play Honest Banker with ourselves, and we're going to pay ourselves back over the next five years, 500 a month or 6000 a year for five years, which is a total of 30000 Now, so let me ask you this question. If you borrow money from a bank, are you expected to pay them back with interest if you're buying a car? So do you think if you borrow money from yourself to buy a car, should you pay yourself back with interest? Absolutely. But do you ever do it? No, you guys never do. See, I don't even know you, and I know what you do with your money. The thing you do is, all right, like if you want to buy a car, the thing you do is you go into your account, you take the money out, go buy the car, and you never, ever have a system to pay yourself back, much less with interest. You have to start treating your money the same way you treat the bank's money. Because if you don't, what you're doing is you're saying your money is not as valuable as the bank's money. So all I'm saying is start paying yourself back with interest the same way you pay a bank back with interest. So in this case, he's going to pay himself back $500 a month or $6,000 a year for five years, a total of $30,000. So let's look and see what we did here in the first eight years. In the first eight years, we put in 10 times 70, 6 times 5 is 30, $100,000. You guys with me? We put in 100 grand total, but we took out 25 to buy the first car. So if we put in 100 and took out 25, how much more did we put in than we took out? 75. So 75,000 is our true net injection. You guys see this? 75,000. Well, how much cash do we have in cash value in the policy? 73 and some change. So if you take 73 and divide it into 75, that just means you got 96 cents or 96% of every dollar back for that first car. How would you like to, sir, have 96 cents back of every dollar for every car you've bought, driven, and owned? Would that be pretty cool? Is there anything stupid, ridiculous, or idiotic that I'm doing here? No, man. I just bought a stupid life insurance policy, and I'm using it to buy the car. You're going to buy the car anyway, right? I'm just adding one step. I don't want you to work harder, change your cash flow, take any additional risk, or lose control. All right? So let's move on because that car wears out, or maybe you want to buy a car for your spouse because she's tired of walking for the last five years. However, I got a feeling it was the other way around. You walked for five, and she got the first car. All right, just checking. So now we're going to go buy another car in the ninth year for $25,000. And that money comes from where? The 73. So now we go buy another $25,000 car. I'm no longer putting premium into the policy. I've stopped the premium in this case because I want to isolate the car loan. So you can see what this is doing in the car loan. So, all right. So I took out 25, it came from the 73, and I'm going to pay myself back exactly the way I was paying myself for the first car, 500 a month or 6,000 a year for a total of 30,000. Because if you had to borrow the money from the bank, you were going to have to pay them back with interest, weren't you? So just treat your money the same way as a bank's money, because if you don't, your money is not as valuable as the bank's money. So now what happened? So now he put in 30, I just want you to pay attention from year 9 to 13. 9 to 13, he put in 30, took out 25. Put in 30, took out 25. How much more did he put in than he took out? 5,000, right? 5,000 is the true net injection. How much cash do we have in the policy? 95. So it grew from 73 to 95. That is a $22,000 growth with a $5,000 net injection. How do you like buying cars my way? Is there anything stupid, ridiculous, crazy, or idiotic that I'm doing? No, man. All I did is I bought a stupid-ass life insurance policy, and I'm using it to buy the car. And you guys are saying, Brent, that wasn't nice. Why did you use the word ass? Because 
Three of you back there are sleeping. Another one's texting. But now you guys are all back with me. It's something about that word ass. It just brings you right back up to the computer. So you got it, right? That's all I did is I added one step in my financial life. I'm not working harder, changing my cash flow, taking any additional risk or losing control. Now watch this. Watch this, because if you've been sleeping, you got to see this. Okay, we got year one to eight and year nine to 13. Let's see what we did here in 13 years, all right? How much did we put in in year one to eight? 10 times seven is 70. Six times five is 30 for 100. And then in year nine to 13, six times five is 30. So we put in $130,000. You guys agree? That's what we put in. But we bought two cars, didn't we? We bought a car in year four for 25 and a car in year nine for 25 for 50. So we put in 130, took out 50. Put in 130, took out 50. How much more did we put in than we took out? 80. 130 minus 50 is 80. So our true net injection is 80. How much cash do we have sitting here? It's okay to say it. 95,000. So wait a minute. Are you telling me the thing we did is put in 130, we took out 50, so our net injection is 80, and now we're here in the 13th year and we have $95,000 in cash in our account and interest? And, car, and, and, and again, so not only do we have the cash, the 95000 guess what else we have? We have the two cars sitting on the driveway. A five-year-old car and a 10-year-old car that we've owned, driven, and used. We can still own them. We can drive them. We can use them. We can sell them, give them away, donate them, whatever you want. So if that's true, okay, if that's true, your net injection is eighty grand, and you've got 95000 in your account plus the two cars on the driveway, how much did those cars cost you to buy, drive, and own? The way my simple mind thinks is zero. I actually have $15,000 more of cash, don't I? Plus, I have the cars. Now, I can't sit here and tell you that they cost you nothing because you had to start the policy. And in the very first year when you put in $10,000, the whole $10,000 was not available to use. But are you in this for the short term or the long term? The long term, we all tend to, we all say long term, but we tend to get hung up in short term thinking, do we not? Have you guys ever heard of a guy named Rick Warren? He wrote a book called A Purpose Driven Life. In that book, Rick Warren says life is like a marathon. It doesn't matter where you start, it only matters how you finish. This is the game of life. All right, so did I just show you how to get all the money back for all the cars you're going to buy, drive, and own? And all we did was what? added one step in our financial life. That's it. I don't want you to change what you're doing. We're just adding one extra step. It's like today, all right, tonight, this evening, after I leave here, I'm going to get in that rental car, and I'm going to go back to the Trenton Airport. And my son's going to pick us up, and we're going to fly back to Florida, right? So I'm going to get in that airplane, but I'm going to drive from here to the Trenton Airport. But guess what I got to do? So, okay, so the thing I'm going to do in... Okay, so like as far in my GPS, I'm going to click in Trenton Airport. And my daughter already did that right before we came here. Because when we stopped, I said, hey, how long is it to the Trenton Airport? So I know how much time it's going to take us to get there. So I'm going to put Trenton Airport into the GPS. But guess what I got to do before I get to the Trenton Airport? Stop and fill the car up with gas, right? I got to return the rental car full with gas. So, but I'm not going to put the gas station in there. I'm just going to put Trenton Airport and I'll find the gas station on the way. So all I've done is I've made one additional step, right? That's all. I'm going to the same destination. I'm just making one additional stop. And that's all we're doing with your money. We're just adding one additional step. And now you're going to recycle and recapture and get all the money back for every car that you're going to buy, drive, and own for the rest of your life. Now, after you leave here today, if you do not go out and get all the money back for all the cars that you're going to buy, drive, and own for the rest of your life for you and your family, whose fault is that? It's your fault. I gave you the message, all right? Up until today, you can say, I never heard about this before. But going forward, if you don't start doing it, it's your own fault because you're the ones that are in control. Okay, now, if I can do this for a $25,000 car, could I do it for a $50,000 car? Sure. All I'd have to do, instead of paying myself $6,000 a year back, I'll pay myself $12,000 a year. How about if mama and daddy had a $50,000 car? What would happen to the numbers? They would go up. 
If I could do this for a car, what about a bicycle? Could I do it for a bicycle, a boat, a cell phone, a house? Did someone say a house? That's right, we're in a real estate seminar. A house. Could you get all the money back for every house you're going to buy, for every house that you're going to buy? Rent out, rehab, flip. So you're thinking, well, Brent, those numbers won't work for a house. Well, it depends, but that's okay. Let's say that you want to buy a, 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 a $250,000 house. So all you do is you add a zero to that number and add a zero to that number. Let's say you want to live under a bridge and you don't like a $25,000 house. You want a $2,500 house. Take a zero off of that one. Take a zero off of that one. It doesn't matter. It works the same exact way. You decide the amount you want to put into this thing and you decide how you want to use it. Remember, write the questions down. I will come back and answer them. Write it down so we don't forget. Short pencil is better than a long memory. So it doesn't matter. Any product or service. Can you do this with a boat, a bicycle, a cell phone, jewelry, clothes? What about taxes, right? So could you pay your taxes and get all the money back? Absolutely. What about, could you take a vacation and get all your money back? Could you go on a honeymoon? Maybe you got kids that are getting married. They're going to do a wedding. What about uh, kids going to school? Can you get the student loan debt? back all the money for the school how about charitable giving could you give to charity and get all of your money back oh brent that ain't right god does not want me to get my charitable giving back well let me just tell you if god did not want you to get your charitable giving back he would not have me in this room right now standing here showing you how to get your charitable giving back and he wouldn't have you sitting in the chairs there just as far as listening of how to get all the money back that you pay for charity are there any poor people that you know adding wings onto any churches? Neither do I, right? It doesn't matter what it is. Every product and service. We're turning every liability into an asset, every depreciating asset into an appreciating asset. Have you ever heard of a guy named Robert Kiyosaki? He wrote a book called Second Chance. He's famous for Rich Dad, Poor Dad, but he wrote a book called Second Chance. In that book, this is exactly what Robert Kiyosaki talks about. But you guys missed it when you read it, or you didn't know what it meant. It's exactly what he talked about. Have you ever heard of a guy named Tony Robbins? He wrote a book called Money, Master the Game. Chapter 5.4 of that Tony Robbins book, is, this is exactly what he's talking about. Remember I said earlier, this is not new. It's not on trial. It's not being tested. It's been around for over 200 years. We're only going to mimic and imitate what the wealthy do. All right, there are three rules. Rule number one. Policy premium deposit. Rule number one, pay yourself first. Now, you've all heard that term, pay yourself first in the past. But see, you don't do it. See, I don't know you, and I know what you do with your money. Every time you get money in, every time your money comes in, it can be active income, passive income, investment income, a birthday check from grandma in the mail. You take that money, and you go put it in someone else's bank, the Bank of Langhorn, the Wells Fargo, Bank of America Chase, right? And guess what you do when you put the money in the bank? You pay everybody else first. You pay the car people, the house people, the student loan, the food, the groceries, the entertainment, the travel. You pay for Bobby's soccer practice, Susie's piano lessons, and you hope there's money left over for you at the end. You've got to start paying yourself first and then pay other people. Rule number two, pay yourself with interest. Just treat your money the same way you treat a bank's money. Pay yourself with interest. Because if you don't, you're saying your money is not as valuable as the bank's money. Rule number three, recycle and recapture all of the money that has been leaving your family. Look, I'm just going to tell you guys this, all right? A $25,000 car is uh, the example I'm using. I did this for any house that I bought. I have some Airbnbs that I have, some VRBOs. I put the money in the policy, and then I go buy the property. And if I don't have enough money in the policy to buy it, it's okay. I'll go to a conventional bank and borrow some of it if I need to, or go to another source and lend it. It's not an all or none. It's not like you got to do it all or none. Do whatever you can do. Um, anyway, I bought, okay, so back in, right, 2003 when I bought my first airplane, I bought, it was $101,000. I didn't know this back then. So I bought the airplane for $101,000. Well, the next airplane I bought was in 2016, or 2015 or 2016, it was $570,000. I did the exact same thing that I'm doing here, except it was a $570,000 airplane and not a $25,000 car. 
I'm doing exactly the same thing. So June of last year, 15 months ago, I upgraded and I bought an airplane for $1,610,000. I'm doing the exact same thing as I'm doing here. It's just a bigger number. It's, that's all it is. It's just a bigger number. But at the end of the day, I recycle and I recapture and I get every single dollar back. So not only do I get the airplane, but I get the money back too. And it's not complicated. You just decide what do you want to put in and what stuff do you want to use to buy the policy with and just recycle and recapture the dollars. It's not complicated. There's my 22-year-old daughter back there has... Five of these policies now, four, five. She has four of her own policies, not to mention the ones that I bought on her in the past. So my daughter has her own house. She bought her own house with her policy. She just bought a conversion van because she likes to travel and camp and go to festivals and stuff. So here's what we did back in April. Okay, basically this black van, a Dodge Promaster, what model is it? I think a 30. 500. So basically the thing we had to do was go to the other coast of Florida, Tampa, Florida to get the van. So we got the van. It's a shell. It, it, it's a brand new shell because it was cheaper to buy a new one in April than it was to buy a used one, really. I mean, I mean, prices of used cars are up, you know, so it was, it was just almost as cheap to buy a new one. So we bought the shell. And then the thing she did is she took it up to Nashville, Tennessee, and the guy kept it up there for what, three months? Three months. He converted it. It's got a bed, a shower, a toilet. She even travels with her cat. It's got a box or the cat to poop in. I mean, it's, it's, this thing's pimp, man. It's just decked out. I mean, it's, um, it's got a shower. It's got solar panels, a hotspot, a Wi-Fi. It's got a place to carry her paddleboard. So after all said and done, she's got $126,000 into this thing, right? But she's going to get every dollar back because she's running it through this exact same system. So it doesn't matter how old you are when you're starting, and it doesn't matter what you use or what you buy. Okay, three rules. Pay yourself first, pay yourself with interest, recycle, recapture your money. If this works for a car, what else does it work for? All right, I've given you four books now, right? I gave you the Becoming Your Own Banker book, the book that Chris and I wrote, Second Chance, Robert Kiyosaki, and Money Master the Game. So those are books that you want to add to your wealth building library, in my opinion. All right, now we're going to get into better fun stuff. Now, after I go through this, you're going to understand how I paid off $984,711 of third-party debt in 39 months, all without working harder, changing my cash flow, taking any additional risk, or losing control, just by adding this one step. So this is called a money multiplier map. And again, all you guys have the handout on this. You can watch up here or the handout, or look on the side screens, however you want to look at it. We create these maps for all of you guys, okay? Not only do we create you one map, we update this map two to three times a year every four to six months, because wherever you're at today in your financial life is not where you were one, five, and 10 years ago, and it's not going to be where you're at one, five, and 10 years from now, because you're going to go through life, and your finances are going to change, right? You're going to buy things, sell things, windfalls, downfalls, raises, demotions. It's constantly changing. So as it's changing, we're going to update that map for you. Now, never, ever, ever will you ever write me a check for a dime or our company, The Money Multiplier, a check for a dime for any of our services whatsoever. So you're probably thinking, well, Brent, this is looking really cool. How much does it cost? How much am I going to pay you? You're never going to pay me a check for a dime. See, I get paid one way. So like, when you buy the life insurance policy... Hopefully, you're going to buy it from me and not your brother-in-law that sells life insurance because your brother-in-law doesn't understand this concept. And if your brother-in-law understood the concept, then why hasn't he told you already, right? But if he really understands the concept, ask him these questions because he might say, hey, hey, bro, I can design that policy for you. Well, ask him these questions. Have him show you how you can borrow at a higher rate than what you're earning and make money all day long. You won't be able to do it. Have him show you how to, to get all the money back on all the cars you're going to buy, drive, and own for the rest of your life. You're not going to know how to do that. And have them create your own money multiplier map for you. They're not going to be able to do that. So that's why you want to work with me and not the guy down the street. And then also, even if the guy down the street knows how to do this, they're going to be very hesitant and skeptical to design your policy this way 
because in order to design this policy this way, we have to take a 60 to 90 percent cut in our commission on the policy. Now, that's how I get paid. See, you guys will never pay me a dime. You're going to buy the policy. I'm going to be your agent, right? And the check that you write is going to be directly to the insurance company. But I get paid a commission on the policy. So I get paid the same way your car insurance guy gets paid. So let's say John Smith is your Allstate agent, right? And that's who you got your car insurance from. So here's what you do, all right? You go buy car insurance. So the check that you write, is that check you write to John Smith or is it to Allstate? It's Allstate. And then Allstate pays John Smith a commission. So that's how I get paid is a commission on the policy. No matter who you buy the policy from, somebody's going to get a commission. Are you with me? Okay. So hopefully cleared up any of those questions. Usually by now you're like, all right, what's the punchline? No, I'm not up here to ask you to buy anything. I'm showing you how to do this. At the end, there's not going to be, hey, let's go ahead and do this and pay me this. No, no, no. If you do this, hopefully you do it with me and I'm your servicing agent. All right? Because this is all I do. I eat, live, and breathe this stuff every day of my life. We have over 3,700 clients in every single state of the country. This is all we do. We are 100% the infinite banking uh, the infinite banking concept, and that's all we do is design the policies for high immediate cash value. All right, so this is the money multiplier map. Remember I said by the time I'm done with this, you're going to know how I paid off $980,000 of debt um, without working harder, changing my cash flow, taking any additional risk, or losing control. I'm not going to show you my exact example because it will take too long, but you'll know when I'm done with this one. This is a real-life one, and this individual... He showed up at our door and he had $470,000 of debt almost. If you look at all the debts on the top, there's 12 of them. He, all right? And on the debts, it basically tells you who he owes. It shows you how much he owes. Uh, he, and it also shows you the interest rate and how much time is left on the debt. So if you add them all up, left to right, it comes to just under $470,000. But I like to under-promise and over-deliver. So on your paper... I want you to write down that he owes four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. That's what he owes. Is four fifty. All right. Now he's going to start his policy. If you notice, all the way on the left is just time. Year one, year two, month one to twelve, month thirteen to twenty-four. And his policy premium deposit in this example is going to be twenty-five thousand dollars a year. The last one was ten thousand. This one's twenty-five. Again, don't get wrapped up in the numbers. If it's too high for you, take off a zero. If that's too much, do $250 a month. It doesn't matter. You can pay your premium monthly, quarterly, twice a year, annually. You can always change the amount that you're putting in. And also, um, uh, yeah, the thing you can always, okay, just change the amount and change the mode. So if you start putting it in, in for example, monthly, you can change it to annually. It's totally flexible. So in this example, he says, hey, I want to put $25,000 into the policy, and I want to pay off all that debt, which I said is $450. It's really a little more, but we're going to say $450, okay? So all he's doing is adding one step. He's going to pay the debt anyway of the $450, right? But he's adding one step by putting money into the policy, the $25. Now, Let's assume there's no interest, and he owes $450,000 of debt, and he's putting in $25,000 a year. So on your paper, I want you to have written down that he owes $450,000. He's going to put in $25,000 a year. Let's assume there's no interest, and he's going to put $25,000 in, okay, to pay that debt off each year. How long will it take him to pay off $450,000? 18 years. $25,000 goes into $450,000 18 times. So on there, I want you to write down, it should take him 18 years. Assuming there's no interest, but there is interest, all right? Let's see how well he does. In the very first month, he puts in 25000 He immediately, how soon is it? Within 30 days, he borrows out 14000 and some change. He takes that money that he just borrowed out from the policy. He pays off Discover. Chase, American Express, Barclays, and he pays lows down from 9500 to, to 7600 He takes that money that he was paying the first four creditors because he no longer owes them anymore. He paid them off, right? So he takes the money he was paying Discover, which is 160 a month, plus Chase 200, 
American Express 200, Barclays 228, add them all up, it comes to 788 a month. So now what he's going to do is he's just going to pay himself back that 788 a month because he no longer owes the creditor. So by doing this, all right, so does he work harder, change his cash flow, take any additional risk or lose control? No. He only changes who gets the money. He's paying it back to himself in his own account. It can go into his checking account, his savings account. It can go directly back into the policy, okay? But he's paying it back himself. So that money that he pays himself every, okay, um, okay so each and every month, that's his to use again immediately, not waiting 30 days today immediately. Are you with me? So he continues to pay himself back for all 12 months there. All right, and now we get to the end of the first year, beginning of the second year. Now we put in 25000 again into premium. Now how much can he borrow? A higher number than up here. And how soon can he borrow the 14.8? Within 30 days. So he's got this, okay, to use on the 14.8, plus he's got the 9400 to use that he's been paying himself back the previous 12 months. So he's got a total of 24.3. So he takes the 24.3, he pays off all of Lowe's. He pays off all of Nordstrom's. He pays off all of Wells Fargo. And he pays down on the BMW from seventeen to 15000 Are you with me? He takes that money that he was paying these three creditors. So uh, 287 to Lowe's, 276 to Nordstrom's, 271 to Wells Fargo. Add those up. Add it to the 788 he was paying himself back. Now he's paying himself sixteen twenty-two a month. Is he changing his cash flow, taking any additional risk, losing control? Nope. All he did is added one step in his financial life. So the sun comes up, sun goes down. We're just living life. All right? Now, if you notice, on the private loan, it only has seven months left here, doesn't it? So look what happens after seven months. It pays off. The private loan pays off, okay? And so now he said, hey, I was paying $922 a month on that private loan. It paid off. I no longer owe the private loan. And he says, I want to add that to the amount that I was paying myself back because he's used to paying it. If he said, no, I don't want to, that's okay. He'll just continue to pay himself $1622 a month or however much he wants to. But he said, no. He says, I want to play honest banker and I want to pay myself back just like I was paying them. So I'm going to take the $922 add it to the 1622, and now we're paying 2544 a month. Are you with me? Are we changing cash flow, working any harder, taking any additional risk, losing control? No, man, we're just living life, right? All right, now, we get to the end of the second year, the beginning of the third year. The end of the second year, beginning of the third year, month 25. We now put in $25,000 into the policy, paying the premium again, because in this case, he's paying it annually. Now he can borrow what? 22. Pretty close to dollar for dollar now, right? Every year, every year those numbers go up. The policy gets more efficient with time. Today's better than yesterday. Tomorrow's better than today. That's not me telling you. That is in your policy contract. Ask anybody in here that has policies, and they'll tell you that it just keeps getting better with time. So now, okay, the 22 is available, plus the money we paid ourselves back the previous 12 months, the 25.9 for a total of 48.3. We take the 48.3, we pay off the BMW, which we were paying 500 a month on. So now we're going to start paying, instead of the 25.44, we're going to add $500 a month and pay 3,044 because we paid off the BMW. Two months later, we have enough money to pay off West Marine, which we were paying 12.61 a month for. So now we're going to take 1261, add it to the 3044, and we're paying ourselves 4305 a month. Are you starting to see how this works? Yeah? Now watch this. This is another aha moment. So if you've been sleeping, you've got to watch this. This is my favorite part right now. How long have we been putting money into the policy for? Three years. How much have we put into the policy? 75. 25, 25, and 25. How much did we take out in year one? We took out a little over 14. Year two, we took out a little over 14. And in year three, over 22. So we put in 75, 
and we're using 50. Basically, we took 50 out. We put in 75, and we're using 50. So how much is in the policy? 25,000, right? That's a good wrong answer. But he's the only one that participated, so thank you for that. Here, you know what? He gets a participation gift because he participated. All right. I'll email you all the rest of the ebook. All right. So he put in 75, and, and um, okay, so we're using 50. So how much is in the policy? 25, right? No. All $75,000 is still in your policy. All 75000 is growing, and, and it's growing at that tax-free growth environment, and the government is completely out of your hair. Because here's what's happening, all right? So the thing that you did is you put $75,000 into the policy. You took out fifty, But the fifty you took out is not your money. You did not take your money out of the policy. Simply borrowed it. You put your policy up for collateral. You took a loan from the general fund of the insurance company. So your money is all growing as if it was all in there. So not only do you use your money, but all of it is still compounding and growing. I thought you guys would be a little more excited about that. Yeah. yeah, right? I mean, is that cool or cool, man? I don't know of another vehicle on this planet that has these features and benefits that allows you to do it. And if you know of one, let me know what it is because I've been looking for 15 years and I haven't found it yet. So if there's something better, let me know where you can use your money and it's going to grow and it has the features and benefits with a the tax-free growth. And, and again, I've even talked about death benefit, right? I'm not even talking about the death benefit that's on the policy. All right. So now let's get to the end of the third year, beginning of the fourth year, month number 37. We put in 25 now. How much can we use now? More than we put in, almost 26. We put in 25 and we got 26 to use plus, uh, all right, the, okay, the previous 12 months, we got 41.9, so a total of 67.9. Now we take the condo and we pay that down from 81 to 12,000. I don't have enough to pay the condo off. I only can pay it down. I just don't have enough in there because I've only got 67, so, and I owe 81. So that's fine. I pay the condo down, but I continue to pay myself back the same amount that I was paying myself up here. Because remember, I said, I don't want you to work harder, change your cash flow, take any additional risk or lose control. So we want to keep your cash flow the same. Are you with me? All right. So now we get to the end of the fourth year. And look, we pay the condo off now. So the condo is now paid off. So we add the 1179 to the 4305. And now we're paying 5484. All right. Now, how long did I say it was going to take us to do this? 18 years, and what month are we in right now? We're in month 49, and we only have the house left. 11 of the 12 debts are gone. Now, let's say you guys don't have debt. You're like, Brent, this looks really good, but I have no debt at all. Well, that's okay. Use it for all the other stuff that you're buying, your expenses. I bet, I, look, man, I've been up here before in, um, in, in like February or March. So how comfortable is it up here in February or March without any heat? Not very, right? So you guys all have electric you pay. You have gasoline bills that you pay. You guys like to eat. I went to lunch with some of you yesterday. I know you like to eat, right? So you got to pay for food. You put gas in your car. Whatever it is, it doesn't have to be debt, third-party debt. It can be your investments. I buy my investment properties with this. I do hard money lending with this. I, I, I do investing in notes. Did you guys see Paige Panzarello the other night, when, 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 right on Thursday night or whatever? You know, so like note investing. It doesn't matter what it is, any product or service. It doesn't matter. It's infinite. So don't think of it as just debt. All right. So now we only have the house left, right? So we've got now, how much do we got? We put in 25. We've got 26 to use there plus the 51. So we got a total of 78. We owe 181 on the house, so we pay it down to 102. So now we're going to continue to pay ourselves back just like we were before. I'm not adding any more because I didn't pay the house off. So now we get to the end of the fifth year, beginning of the sixth year, month 61. Now we pay premium into that policy. How much are we paying now? 10000 How much were we paying before? Why are we only paying ten? 
Here's why. There's two parts of the policy. Not that you guys really need to know this, but there's two parts of the policy. There's the base premium and the paid up additions rider. In this example, what we did is we put 40% or $10,000 into the base premium, and we put the other 60%, 15,000, into the paid up additions rider. That's typically how you design a banking policy. Not to get into the weeds and all about it, but okay. So now at this time, because the policy is five years old, and it doesn't have to drop off, or if it, actually, even if we wanted to drop it off sooner, we could, or we could keep it on longer. But the thing that I'm doing is I'm dropping off the paid up additions rider portion of the policy, what we call the PUA rider, which is 60%. I'm dropping it off because it is no longer as efficient. And now the base premium is driving the cash value of the policy. Because see, very early on when the policy started, the paid up additions rider, okay, the 60% or that 15 grand, that is what was driving your cash value, okay? That was driving the cash value because anyway, the base premium had very little or no cash value in the first couple or few years. But now that the policy is more seasoned, it's more efficient, we're gonna drop the paid up additions rider off and we're just gonna pay the base premium. Here's the way to think about it. Have you ever guys seen the space shuttle take off in the space? And you got the space shuttle and two booster rockets? And when that shuttle gets way up in the air, what happens to those booster rockets? They fall off. Why do they fall off? They're no longer needed. So it's, it's the same thing like when we flew here from Florida, right? So we took off, and how are we burning our fuel? We're burning our fuel on takeoff, climbing up the altitude. And then, and then so coming over here, we came over here at 27,000 feet. We're in cruise altitude. We're burning way less fuel at cruise than you are in the takeoff mode, right? So now we're just in the cruise mode. So now the base premium is going to drive the cash value. And what most people do at the time they drop off the paid up additions rider or even before, right? Actually, the majority do it before, but now they're going to start a second policy, a second policy. Now, if you work with us, You'll never wait more than five years to start a second policy. We have over 3,700 clients in every state of the country. 91% of my clients that have been with me a year longer have more than one. 70% of them come back before the first year is even up. Ask Paul how many he has. Ask Larry how many he has. Ask Jamie how many they have, right? Or whoever else in here that has them. Ask them if they only have one or they got more than one, right? There's, they're back there. You look at them. They're all pointing up their hands. They'll be like just having to take off their shoes and count on their toes. All right, so now we start a second policy, a branch office. So let me ask you this. All, okay, so the bank that you bank with, is there one branch or are there multiple branches? Multiple branches. So can you have multiple branches of your own bank? Absolutely. So that's all we're going to do is we're going to start another bank. I have 19 of these. I put about a half a million a year into mine. I buy at least one policy every one to two years because I want as much money that I can get into this thing as possible into the later years. Because look, what happens in this policy that's 61 months old? Five years in one month. I put in $10,000. How much can I use right away? Immediately, 13. Now I'm not a math genius or anything, but I know if I put in 10 and I can use 13, that is a 30% increase on my money. How much of your money do you want growing at 31% in 61 months? The correct answer would be all of it. My oldest policy I started in February of 2008. All right. So and so all right, so anyway, it's 13 and a half years. This past February, every dollar that I put into that into that policy and that 13-year-old policy, it gave me $2.09 to use in, in year 13. Next year, in year 14, which is February coming up, I'll put in a dollar. It's going to give me a higher number than 209 to use. So you are never, ever, ever going to want to stop paying your premium in a whole life policy in a mutual company that pays dividends. If you guys ever think you want to stop paying the premium, you do not need financial counseling. You need severe psychiatric care. All right? You'll never want to. Because how hard is it for you to give me a dollar if I'm going to give you back a dollar thirty. How many times a day do you want to do that? Every day. You'll do that seven days a week, even on Sunday. You'll even probably um, just not turn on the, the game, right? So the Eagles or the 76ers game. You'll skip it to do that. You might even skip church to give me to do that deal. No, that's pushing it a little too much? All right. 
right? You're never, ever, ever going to want to stop paying premium into a whole life policy in a mutual company that pays dividends. It just gets better each and every year. So next year, which I don't have on this, but in year seven, he's going to put in 10,000. Then, okay, so that number is going to be a higher number than that number because it's one year more efficient. It's not me telling you that. You will see that in your policy contract before you ever accept, sign, and pay for it. You will see all of your numbers. All right, so now, here we are, month 61. We put in 10, we got 13. We started the brand new one for 25, so it's brand new, so we got 14. 14 and 13 is 27. 27 plus 65 is 93. We have 93,000. How much do we owe on that last debt? Only 90, so we completely pay off the house. We've eliminated all of those debts, which is almost $470,000. How long did I tell you it was going to take us to do it? Didn't take 18, 15, 10. We did it in five years and one month. How happy do you think this family was? Is there anything stupid, ridiculous, crazy, or idiotic that we did? No, man. We just added this stupid policy into our life. We're just living life. That's it. One step in your financial life. Now, let's... All right, question. If he wanted to go faster, could they have went faster? Yeah, they could have paid more premium. They could have started more policies earlier. They could have paid themselves more back than just, okay, the amount they were paying. Could they have went slower? They could have paid less premium. They could have decided not to pay themselves back. They could have not started a second policy. So there's no risk factor in this at all. Nobody in your state or any state of the country has ever lost money in a whole life policy in a mutual company that pays dividends. Go look it up and find it for me. No, because the insurance company is contractually obligated to do what they're going to do. So the only risk factor in everything I'm talking about is you. You are the risk factor. And who do you know better than you? Right? Now, let's kind of peel back the onion a little more. How much money did they actually put into this thing to pay off that $470,000? Well, how much did they, okay, how much in year one did they put in? 25 in year two, 25, three, four, and five, 25. Five times 25 is 125, plus 10 is 135, plus 25 is 160. They injected $160,000 of outside money, and they paid off almost $470,000 of debt, and they kept their cash flow exactly the way that it was when they showed up at the door. So how fast you go or how slow you go, it's completely up to you. Okay. I'm going to skip this, but I will show you how you can watch a, a couple things that I skipped, but I'm, I'm going through. The, now, you're probably thinking, who does this? Who does this? All right, who uses it? Well, I was about to do a live presentation in Denver, Colorado, and um, I got there a little early, so I opened up my computer, and I went to ESPN.com. I wanted to see what the sports scores are. You know, that's a good month for sports, right? So November. So I opened up the computer, and here's this article on ESPN.com. Cash value life insurance makes Harbo College football's top paid coach. So the, so the thing they did is they paid his salary through the policy because they're getting all the money back. They're not only paying his salary, but they get the money back. So like I owned five chiropractic clinics. This is exactly how I funded my clinics, exactly like this. All right. So after I learned about it, this is how I paid my payroll. This is how I bought the headrest paper or the x-ray film or the therapy and the rehab equipment exactly through the policy. So the University of Michigan is paying him the salary. So now not only do they pay his salary, but they get all the money back. And if you guys know anything about college football, it's a good thing they designed it like this so they're getting the money back because he has not won the games he's supposed to won. Maybe this year he's a little better, but he hasn't won the games over the last few years. All right, Walt Disney. How did Walt Disney fund it? After he failed in the pursuit of traditional means of financing, he had to borrow, provide his own financing by collaterally borrowing from cash value from his life insurance policy to fund Disneyland. Who knows if Disney World would even be here if it wasn't for a whole life policy? Hell, I don't know. What about McDonald's? Ray Kroc. He had to use policies to pay for um, his, okay, to cover his key employee salaries. And he also used some of the money for the mascot that we all know of as Ronald McDonald. Where is Ronald lately? I haven't seen Ronald McDonald. What the heck is he doing? Maybe he's got a mask on and we just don't recognize him. All right. Pampered Chef. Here's a lady, Doris Christopher. She started this company called Pampered Chef with $3,000 in her Chicago home. 
And she later sold the company to Warren Buffett for $1.5 billion. But she had to borrow the money from her policy. And here's, nope, I, I thought I had a couple more in there. President Joe Biden, right? I, actually, I have another slide deck. So, uh, so uh, President Joe, yeah, that's probably why we took it out of this slide. We don't want to make you guys mad. But anyway, Joe Biden. So there's an article, July of 2014, and actually I have the slide if anybody wants it. All right, just ask Anna if she can get it. But July of 2014, so Joe Biden says, I have no cash, or no, he says, I have no stocks, no bonds, no savings account. July of 14, Joe Biden had six whole life policies in a company that I write business with. Who knows how many he has now. Now that you know this information that I just went over with you, everybody should be doing it. And if you don't, it, I mean, it's fine, but you know the information. You have been armed with the information. You decide what you want to do, whether it's with me or someone else. I just hope it's with me. But anyway, if you're going to do it. But now that you know this, whether it's me or someone else, everybody should do this. Because if you don't do this, not only are you stealing from yourself, but you're stealing from your spouse, your children, your grandchildren, and future generations to come because you're letting money leave the family. All that money is leaving your family. Now, there's us and the super wealthy. Us and the super wealthy, right? We all have access to the same financial tools, do we not? The only difference between us and the super wealthy is they use the tools differently. Now that I know how to play the game, I'm just using the same tools that they've been using for over 200 years. I'm not going to change anything. I'm not going to reinvent anything. I mean, I didn't create any of this crap I'm going over with you today. I'm just using the tools that the wealthy have been using for over 200 years. Now, so there's a guy named Warren Buffett. You guys ever heard of him? And here's what Warren Buffett said. Now, I like things to be really simple. I don't like complicated stuff. I am not the smartest guy in the room by any means whatsoever. As a matter of fact, it took me 13 trimesters to pass 10 trimesters of chiropractic college in St. Louis, Missouri at Logan Chiropractic College because I kept failing classes. After I finally did pass, it took me an extra two years to get my license because I kept failing part three of national boards. And they would give it to me once every six months. So I am not the sharpest candle on, the, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed. I'm not the brightest candle in the cake. And sometimes people say I'm a couple donuts short of a dozen. So I'm not that smart, but I know this. I'm just going to do what the wealthy do. And here's what Warren Buffett said. And now I don't know when he first said it, but I heard it for the first time in October of 2008. And this is how simple it is. This is it. Warren Buffett said, if poor people would just start doing what rich people do, they wouldn't be poor anymore. How much sense does that make? So that's all we're going to do, is we're just going to mimic and imitate exactly what the wealthy do. Now, only one of two things are going to happen to every one of us in this room. In the next 10 minutes, 10 hours, 10 days, 10 weeks, 10 months, 10, 20, 30, 50 years. Only one of two things are possible. The thing is that we're going to just live or we're going to die. Now, I like to use the word graduate, but you use whatever word you want. So we're, all right, so either we're going to live or we're going to die. Are we better off with or without this concept if we live? Hopefully you think we're better off with it. But it's not an if we die, past, graduate, it's a when. So like when that happens, are we and, our better, and whoever our beneficiaries are better off with or without? With, because of the death benefit. How much today did I even talk about death benefit? How much did I really talk about life insurance? How much should I talk about the policies are exempt from judgments and liens in most states, Pennsylvania being one of them, protected against lawsuits and judgments? So I remember O.J. Simpson. He was found not guilty of, of, of um, he was found not guilty of, of, of the, uh, what's, what's the kid's name, the Goldman kid and his wife's murder? He was found not guilty in the criminal trial, but he was found guilty in the civil trial from the Goldman family, and he owed them all that money, didn't he? Did they ever get the money? Where was it at? Protected. Remember Ken Lay with Enron? Remember him? He owed all that money, had a judgment against him. Did, so did those people ever get that money? Never. Where was it at? There's a lot of other examples. The internal growth of the policy grows tax-free. See, 
The thing we want to do, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, is we want to pay tax on our money one time, one time only, at the lowest rate possible, and get that money into a tax-free environment where it's growing tax-free and the government is completely out of our hair. Do we not? The loan never has to be paid back. You never, ever have to pay back your policy loan. As a matter of fact, the insurance company will never ask you if you're going to pay it back. They'll never ask you when. They'll never ask you why you want to borrow the money. A loan is simply a prepayment of the death benefit. The insurance company can never, ever lose because the death benefit will always be higher than your cash available. And the insurance company knows you're guaranteed to die, pass, or graduate. So at the time of your death, the death benefit will pay off any outstanding policy loan and the rest will go to your beneficiaries tax-free. All right, why are we doing this? There's probably a lot of reasons that we're doing this, but Larry's going to dance. Why are we doing this, Larry? I want to be a billionaire. Oh. Hang on, we're going to do this, man. We're going to get this right. Hang on. All right, why are we doing this? I want to be a billionaire. I want to be a billionaire. Oh, this is the other song. What's this one? That was the other song that you missed yesterday. Oh, man. These guys must be mad at me in the past. Billionaires so freaking bad. Buy all of the things I never had. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. Again, all right, guys, so remember, all you got to do is send me an email, brent at themoneymultiplier.com. I'll email you the ebook if you want it. If uh, this is something you want to do or you think you may want to do it or you just want more information about how it will work for you. So I take a picture of this screen. All right, so anyway, it's got my name up there. It's got my phone number that you can text me on on that number. You can call me on that number too. Call or text on that number. It's got my email, brent at the If If uh, there's a time and a day, all right, so that you want to schedule, just go to this calendar right here, all right, and you can schedule on the calendar, um, and I'll do a, a call with you. We'll just answer your questions. I set them up for 45 minutes. We may need five minutes. We may need longer. Oh, also on the back of your sheet, if, if this is something you think you want to do, on the back of this sheet right here, all I want you to do is I want you to write down your name, your email, and your phone number. But do not turn these into me unless you really want me to contact you. Okay? Please, just don't give them to me and then ghost me when I call you or text you or email you. All right? So only if you want me to contact you and you want to talk about this, then like fill this out. And I want you to give it to Hannah. Hannah, stand up. All right, that's my daughter. Is Hannah, my assistant. A lot of you guys know her. So just give them to Hannah, and then I will contact you. Or if uh, you want to go schedule ahead of time on the calendar, you can do that as well. But a lot of times you guys don't do that, so you hand those in, and then I'll contact you to remind you because you guys forget. And then if uh, you want to watch the full presentation again, or if there's anything that you missed or you came in late or you went to the bathroom or went and got cookies or whatever, the thing you can do is go to the website, www.themoneymultiplier.com, Go under the Resources tab, click on Presentation, and the full presentation is there. It's all broken up into 10 sections, and also the downloadable attachments are there. So if somebody is not here now that you think should see that, just go watch the full recorded version of the presentation. I don't know. What, where's that coming from? All right. So, um, okay, that's it. I'm done. I left some time for questions, so I'll take those. Thank you guys for... Coming out. All right, All right, first question. We're going to just raise your hand if you have a question. And we'll get oh, you. microphone. Okay, go ahead. Or, or, or actually, I can repeat the question, too, if you don't have a mic. Yeah. Uh, as far as related, Okay, wait, wait hang on. Tommy, hang on. He, Tommy. He's right behind you. Then I'll get you next time. As far as paying the interest on the loan, is it always at the end of the year, or can you... Yeah, actually, I, okay, on the interest on the policy loan, no, the thing talking. I recommend is you pay it annually on your policy anniversary date. So let's just say your date is January 1st, and let's say you took out $10,000 from the policy. Remember that the interest that you pay on the loan is simple interest, much like a HELOC. The interest that you make inside of the policy is compounded interest. So for example, let's say you borrowed $10,000 out, 
you kept the money for a whole year, that would be $500 in interest. Or if you kept it out for six months, it would be $250 in interest at 5%. Now, even though I showed you interest is 6%, it's never 6%. All my numbers are actually in, okay, all this, okay, so all my numbers look better in um, your real life actual policies instead of what I have up here. So it's going to look better in real life. I'm always about under promising and over delivering. Did I answer your question? Yes, sir. Can you put a non-related child on the policy? It, it depends. What do you mean by non-related? The one that was at McDonald's the other day Tommy. and you just haven't been eating at the same time or what? Just one you find on the street. So, so okay, so can you put a non-related child on the policy? All right. So the insured individual has to be someone that you have a vested interest in of some sort, right? You got to have some kind of vested interest. And now, like, I think up until 10 or 12 years ago, so at Walmart was buying pol these policies on every one of their employees. Now, they still do it but they just have to know about it. Before, they didn't know about it. But they still do it, but they have a vested interest in the employee. So I don't know about the non-related child. It just depends on... Yes, you would have to get a parent or guardian to sign off um, if the child's a minor. If, if it's, right, so if they're 18 or over, then you don't need a parent or guardian. Okay? Uh, that's your question. Okay, who else? Again, it's great. I, I can repeat the question. So I want to go back to the interest question. Yeah. So you say said it's five hundred dollars in a year if you don't pay the if if your loan is out for the full entire year. Yeah. Yep. So that's but right. But if you're paying based your, on ten thousand dollars. Right. But if you're paying yourself back every month, right. is, is the interest part of that? Yeah. Well, then the interest would be paid. It depends if you're sending the money back to the policy if you're continuing to keep the money and use it for other projects. Because just for example, like me, I don't ever ever worry about paying back my policy loans. Because, again, I want that money in motion because it's growing anyway, even though that all right. the money is in the policy, right? It's all growing. So, so okay, the thing I do is take it out, and I use it to make other investments. So, I, so I don't worry about paying back the policy loan. I have one more question. How many policies can you take out on yourself? It's, it's just not the amount. It's the amount of premium that you put in, which is going to equal your death benefit. Because, see, the thing you can't do is over-insure a body the same way you can't over-insure a car or a house. So what's going to happen is the insurance company is going to take a look at you. They're going to look at your age, your health, your gross income, and your net worth. And that's a dollar amount they assign to your body. So that's what your body is worth, according to them. Kind of scary, but that's the way they do it, right? So, and again, all right. And then, so as soon as we get to that number, um, okay, as far as death benefit goes, then you'll be maxed out until your income or net worth goes up. Then you can go apply for more, but that's okay. Just go get it on a spouse, a child, a niece, a nephew, a business associate. You know, it doesn't happen a lot where we run out of bodies, but we do run out of bodies. Ask Hannah. There's people out there that want to buy more policies, and they're maxed out. They've maxed themselves out. And they've maxed their children out. I mean, they've maxed everybody out. So we tell them to have sex and have more kids, and they can buy more policies. Right. right. I have a quick two two part question. So I've been paying back the the loan every year, and yep. then borrowing it back out with interest. Do I need to even pay it back each year and borrow it back? No, out, just, just pay back it? the interest only. I don't pay back my policy loans okay. unless I have no use for the money. Now, if I have no use for the money. I'm going to pay it back into the policy instead of the conventional bank. So, like, for example, I mean, with me, I mean, I keep, like, no money in a conventional bank. I keep enough money in a conventional bank for about two months worth of overhead for my lifestyle. If Okay, so, like, if the conventional bank account is just growing more than that, I send the money back to the policy or I'm going out and looking for another deal or an investment. So I don't like keeping money in a conventional bank. Okay, and then you said you dr you drop the premium after the fifth year. Can you just elaborate? Is it be is it better to drop the premium and then open up another policy instead of just paying the extra? Absolutely, as long as you're insurable. Because the thing is, is uh, all right. The whole idea is to get as much money into these things into that third, fourth year, and beyond. And I know, okay, just because of what Paul just asked, a lot of you said, well, why wouldn't we just put more premium? in that same policy you cannot 
because each policy is a contract, so you can't overfill it, right? So in other words, okay, so just think of this bottle as holding 12 ounces. There's no way I'm ever going to get into this bottle 16 ounces. It simply won't hold it, right? So I have to start another policy because each policy is a contract, and if you try to overfill that existing policy, it becomes this thing we call a MEC, M-E-C. It stands for Modified Endowment Contract. It's something our good old government put into place back in June of 1988, and it says if your policy becomes a MEC, it's no longer treated as an insurance contract, it's treated as an investment, and it's subject to taxation. So that's why we start additional policies. MEC, M-E-C, Modified Endowment Contract. contract. On that black book, that Nelson Nash book, page 38. Yeah, where? Hello, I'm Cindy. Um, you said that some people, for a variety of health reasons or whatever, aren't, like, I can't take a policy on me. That means nobody else can take a policy on me either. That's right. Okay. That's right. It, yep. So like, if a person is not insurable, then they're not insurable because uh, the insurance company is going to check to see if you're insurable. Because, right, so, like, even if you were ready to start a policy today, it's going to be at least a month before you can start because the insurance company has to make sure you look as good on the inside as you do on the outside. So they're going to ask you some health questions. They're going to take a little blood and make you pee in a cup. So they're going to check that out. Yes, sir. Awesome. Well, Brent, we're at time. So everyone, you have Brent's information here. So please take a picture. He's great with communication. So I'm sure a lot of people will have questions once they go home and look at this stuff further. If you have your sheets, p please pass them to the left-hand side. And Hannah's going to collect them. It will make her job a lot easier. But let's give Brett a round of applause. Thanks, guys. For sharing that life-changing information with us. And I will be giving some of his stuff out later. Yeah. So the book here, you can give the book out, the Becoming Your Own Banker book, yep. the audio. And then there's like eight or nine of those other So I'm keeping an eye on well. who's participating. All right. All right, guys. Thank you. Okay. Round of, one more round of applause. Thank you, Brent. And as he mentioned, me, Juliana, and Pedro all have policies. Paul has a couple. And when I spoke to his team, I said, I want to do this for everything. My my gas, my groceries, everything. He said, okay, just start with first things first, and we'll eventually get you there. So once you fully start to understand it, you'll see why he does what he does. All right? At this time, we are going to take a 15-minute break. When we come back, we're going to break out into the mastermind or is it mastermind groups? Well, just the breakout groups. And so everyone be back here at 1130 and we will get you assigned and get you connecting further with these intelligent speakers. We'll see you soon. I know, I know, I saw she was answering questions. She's smarter than the class. I know. She's smarter than me. I was like, oh my god, she answered questions. I was like, like that? So that's what I remember by. <laughs>
Angelina.